Welcome to Truth Be Told, the podcast about being genuine and living your most authentic life. Today, I am excited about my guest. She is a, you know, an award-winning poet and an activist about her health. So she is a jack of all trade. And I've, I've known this guest for years. I can tell you that she is the, the real deal. Uh, uh, listeners, it is my pleasure to have on this episode, Majin Maturin. Majin, welcome to Truth Be Told. Thanks, Fiel. Um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited about um, our conversation. We actually go back to, to poetry back in like the university. Like I've, I've seen you do it when there was the when Breath in Poetry in Edmonton started as a small initiative, and you actually performed as the one that was like open mic nights. That's right. Yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm a writer, a uh, spoken word poet. Um, I'm also a patient advocate. Um, and my journey has been pretty long. And as you mentioned, like we met, um, we, yeah, I mean, we, we, we went to school together. Uh, which is exciting to kind of see both of our journeys career-wise and everything else. And so, um, yeah, back, I believe it was around 2010-ish was when um, Breath in Poetry Collective um, was birthed. I may be wrong around the year, but it was around that time frame where, um, you know, it was at Rouge Lounge on Jasper Ave where we would have regular open mic nights. And um, this was like the early stages of spoken word, of the spoken word poetry scene in Edmonton. And um, yeah, that was kind of the, the first place really that I shared my, my, my poetry. It was even around the time that I never thought I'd, I'd be writing poetry in the first place. I've always, I've always enjoyed the art form and admired other poets but the idea that I could write was uh was uh, was not something that I ever considered <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and so um yeah because for me it all started um around the time of the earthquake and which is why I remember the year because it was it was in 2010 um when Haiti had its huge earthquake and I remember during that time being um, at a loss for words, really. Uh, I was just overwhelmed. I was very, I just had a lot of emotions that I really didn't know what it was like exactly I, because it was, it was just everything. It was shock, um, you know, looking on CNN and watching, watching a lot of just footage of, of um of what Haiti looked like and remembering you know my childhood because I grew up in Haiti I remember visiting Le Palais National which is the national palace and I remember looking on CNN where the roof of the national palace like um collapsed on itself and it was just um oh my god it was just it was just a lot of emotions and um, and a lot of people in my in my community at the time they knew that I was Haitian and they and I realized that uh, especially during that time that they that I was the only Haitian they knew personally and so there were a lot there was a lot of people that reached out to me um, you know just to see if I was okay but also seeing if my family was affected trying to find a way to support in any way they can and I remember just feeling overwhelmed by that and 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 also not really knowing the answers because I didn't know what my um where my uh like I didn't know if my my dad was okay because he was he was um 
he was there. And so in all of the mixture of all these emotions, um, I just remember not really knowing what to do with them. And so it landed, it eventually landed on paper where I just tried to write down how I felt and that became my first, uh, my first piece. Wow. <laughs> so that's how I, I and, and so for me, that was like the trajectory of realizing that like, you know, um, poetry in particular has a way of being able to help you process a lot of complicated thoughts and emotions. But not only that, is that it also gives you the ability to reclaim some level of power over a situation. Because for me, what happened was I was feeling, over time, I, I was feeling really upset by what the media portrayed Haiti as. Mm -hmm. and, and I was getting frustrated by, by, by all of it. And so the poem, ended up becoming more of me processing the earthquake and the loss of it all, but also, you know, re-emphasizing to people to look again. That's why the poem is called Gadepeim, which means um, look at my country, but also it's also called look again. Um, and, and that's a way for, it was for me to, to, to allow people into what I see my country as, um, you know, in contrast of what the media was um, was describing it as. Wow! So almost like a, almost like a healing you know, process for you because you have so much, so much pride in Haiti being being your home mm -hmm. and. And also, people, you want to have people uh, look at Haiti and, and say, "No, like this is a country that in that is rich in in culture, rich in resources. You need to uh, look at it uh, that uh, that way. You know, this is the, the real the Haiti that you need to see." Exactly, and and it's also about reclaiming the just the strength and the power of people, of the Haitian people, because um, it was just, even if it, it was it, the reality, it the reality was that, you know, there was a lot of people that obviously died that were in very dire circumstances. Um, but I wanted to also remind the people of, of the strength of Haitian people and what they've overcome and um, and to not forget that in the midst of what they're looking at, you know? And so that's what the poem was about. And it became a journey of just like, like I, I'm realizing that like, there's a, that's a common thread, I guess, in my own journey, my own creative journey, both in advocacy and also in the types of poems that I end up writing. And it's always about reclaiming some level of power and going back to those moments where where maybe my voice was silenced and then and then giving words to that um and and i it, and yeah and in my own personal health journey it was like that because it's even you know um just for context like my i i have lupus which is a chronic um, health condition. It's an autoimmune uh, disease that that affects a lot of women of color, actually, um, between the age of 25 to 40, typically. And it's basically when your immune system starts, um, your immune system becomes destabilized. And, and so what ends up happening is that it affects a lot of different organs, and um, it's, it's known as the disease with a thousand faces. Um, and the reason why they say that is because everyone who has lupus has a completely different story. There's no, there's no um, linear description of, you know, even if I, my symptoms started as joint pain, somebody else, their symptoms might have started with uh, renal failure um, or seizures. And so it's a very complicated, um, 
autoimmune condition that often gives way to others. And so for me, when in my own journey, um, I've, you know, it, 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 it's been a 11 year journey where I had to learn how to stand up for myself, how to find words to explain how my body is feeling and even finding words to explain what, what I need as far as support from people around me. And so, um, so yeah, so I've, I've got, I've, I feel like my, my whole life has been a journey of finding words for those moments and then giving voice to that mm -hmm. and hopefully helping others um, borrow from the words that I find, <laughs> if yeah. that makes sense. Watching how you've told your story on your platform, you, you, you actually you know, just own your story and you actually, actually show that you are you you, you uh, you're not falling a, a, a victim to your the situation but rather you control it mm -hmm. and and I admire what you've done like you've like just just on your own you you said you raised what like uh, was it a thousand dollars for was it the lupus walk in in calgary that's right yeah so a few years ago um this was like my first attempt in trying to fundraise um more money for the lupus society of alberta okay. um and um and i wanted to do that just because i first of all i wanted for more people to be aware of what lupus was, but also, you know, recognizing that not a lot of, the fact that not a lot of people know about it also means that there's less resources that are available for people living with lupus. And so it was a two for one where I was like, you know what, let me, let me try and see if I can rally others to come alongside me in, in, in raising money. And so, um, yeah, so, it, so I raised, I believe it was a little over uh, $1,100, I think, at the end. Um, the goal was a, the goal was a thousand. And, and I was so grateful that others just continue to donate over that. And I definitely want to try and do that again, um, mm -hmm. or maybe combine a little bit more of my poetry and my art to kind of rally more uh, funding for <laughs> For, for the Lupus Society of Alberta or organizations like that, because I, I, mm -hmm. I, I value what they do because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it makes a difference when you, when you actually connect with others who have the same lived experience, because, um, because it can be very, very isolating mm -hmm. to live with a health condition that no one around you has, because as much as you may or others like uh, as much as others might be able to empathize mm -hmm. and you know try to support mm. when you're trying to explain to them how they how you feel there's there will always be a disconnect because mm -hmm. they don't have that experience in their bodies but um you know it hits different when I talk to someone with lupus and say you know, I've been living with a lot of fatigue the past week and they know exactly what that means versus someone who may not have that experience, you know what I mean? And so to be able to have resources to give into organizations to help support others who are navigating those things is like, it's so crucial, especially to the quality of life of, of, of a lot of us, because oftentimes when you do have a, a chronic illness like that, it can put you out of work, um, and it can it, and it can also just create a lot of inconsistencies in your ability to even show up for work and the nature of your work. I I have epilepsy. I have, was diagnosed with with the, that condition nine years ago. So mm. I can I can uh, obviously I don't have. No, I don't, like I don't have the same uh, the symptoms mm -hmm. or side effects that right. lupus has, but 
And you're absolutely right. Like all other things that, and that everyone goes through different stories and you're right. It even impacts like your well being or even your work. Yeah, it's a different kind of lonely, I, th I think, um, where it's almost like you're, you're, you're lonely within yourself too. Like, it's not just like, you know, the experience, but it's just like, especially, you know, when you, when you're, when your life begins to change because of, because of your health condition, you know, um, where you realize that like, you know, you used to be able to, to work, and, and to work, um, you know, to, to do the task and to do it easily and to do it well. And then when you slowly realize that it's just harder to do, um, it's, it's so hard because now you have to kind of reassess how you view yourself. And it could be very disorienting. And, and it's really hard to explain to people around you because you also you never, you know, especially at the beginning, you you've never dealt with something like that and so mm -hmm. it's like you're processing this this weird grief um yeah. like by yourself unless yeah. you know someone around that that has had that same health condition they might be able to kind of walk you through right. what their experiences was you know yeah that you know the you you're mentioning uh, the uh, weird you know, grief like what did you actually mean by by grief uh, like the uh, weird you know, grief like what because yeah uh, so <laughs> uh, obviously it's like uh, by grief i know that certain people might be thinking a, a loss in their in their life yeah yeah so for me when i when i'm talking about grief it was, um, you know, um, my life before lupus mm -hmm. was always go, go, go. Mm -hmm. um, I like doing a lot of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was involved at my, at my church. I never, I never, um, and I would always have some kind of social involvement in the community, doing my poetry while working my nine to five. And, um, you know, I never had to depend on medication. And, you know, three to four months into having to take Plaquenil, um, I was, I was tired, I was angry. Um, mm. That, you know, because I was realizing that, like, I will always have to take this in order for me to be able to get out of bed without joint pain. Like, I remember rebelling against that. Like, my grief kind of showed up in, in a way of, like, rebellion. So, for me, it was, like, you know, I would, like, just intentionally not take my medication just because I just wanted to, like, not do it. Like, I don't, I didn't want to take my, my meds. And so, I wouldn't. But what would happen is I would be bedridden the next day because, <laughs> because my joints are reminding me that, no like there's still a lot of inflammation in your body and this medication is lowering it so that you can be able-bodied you know and so so there was this war going on inside myself where I was just like really mad that I had to do this mm -hmm. and um and it's not something that I was able to even explain or share with my family because none of them had understand what that is or what that meant and also like I don't I didn't I don't have any family in the city so it was everything was always just phone call check-ins and that's you can only say so much by phone mm -hmm. and so yeah the, my grief came like that but it was also just sadness and and pity really because you just start feeling sorry for yourself um because it's sad it sucks <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> you know and um I think for me, what got me through my grief was, was a lot of just like, I mean, prayer, because for me, I, I, I believe in God. And, yeah. um, and that, to me, just anchored me a little bit 
more um, to something that was outside of myself. And so that that helped me um, remember that I am more than than this body um, and that I have access to a power that is outside of myself to empower me. And so that to me has been like very foundational in the, in the hard days to remember that, that the God that created me is still present in my pain. Yeah. And so, um, and I know that not everybody believes that, but for me, that that's been like a crucial part of my anchoring, especially when I would be frustrated and, and not to say that, like, you know, my faith has always been high and everything's been great. No, I've been mad at God. <laughs> I've been mad <laughs> at life. I've been, you know, but, but I think there's a, it's almost like there's a, there's a level of like, um, of surrender that I, that I managed to do. And when I say surrender, I mean, like, I've, I've had to just kind of surrender the process, surrender surrender the this idea that you know every plan that I had for myself might not happen and so I had to just whatever expectation I had about what my life was going to be I needed to just let it let it be what it is and that was really hard and I think the grief that a lot of us who have chronic illness have is the fighting you're fighting for this life that you know that you want versus the reality of what is. Mm. And it's like this constant tug of war where sometimes the, whatever the sickness is kind of takes over your reality in a way that you don't like it. And sometimes it's indefinite. Sometimes you don't even know when, when you'll get back to some semblance of like what you, you want out of your life, you know? And I've, I, for me, like through my faith, it's like I, I learned to just let go. Um, even when I didn't know what that future was going to look like, I needed to not try to predict what to my tomorrow was going to be and to just trust that, you know, that the God that sustained me today we'll figure it out tomorrow because I did not have the capacity to think about that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like this weird, like, it's so weird, like, okay, I'm give, not, not a giving up because it could come across as giving up. <laughs> yeah. um, but a more of just like right now, I, you know, my, my, my sickness is landing me just in bed and I only have the strength to do this. And, and, even if I want to do X, Y, and Z right now, my body's not letting me. Therefore, I have to trust that I will get to X, Y, and Z at the time that I will have the strength to do that. You know what I mean? And then yeah. just, and, and and I can't say that I, it happened like year one or year oh, no, two. No, 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 no. My... It's, a, it's a process. Yeah, exactly. Because um, with grief, it, it, it is a healing you know, process. Mm -hmm. um, like exactly. you, you, you've heard of the five stages of, of grief yes yeah and you know with and obviously with faith being a major part of your your life you know like the bargaining stage was mm -hmm. major <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yes. it, it sounded like a lot of prayers like you know god if you get me out of this i will do xyz you yeah. know like help me out here and so yeah yeah so meanwhile some people just get stuck at denial or just straight up anger yeah yeah because the i think it, the five stages is what uh there's denial anger bargaining depression acceptance yeah i uh, think sometimes I think some people yeah. don't go through those five stages in that order mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and also like yeah because grief 
grief is not linear grief is not like step oh, one no you know ta, ta, ta. Oh, like step God. two it's you know you go you you get angry and then mm -hmm. everything's fine you live your life you don't even think about it and then all of a sudden you're sad boom yeah and then you're in, angry again and then you're in denial <laughs> and then you're yep. angry again <laughs> yep. <You know>? I've been, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i've been there like I, all of a sudden uh, yeah I, that, it happened actually uh, with you know, just uh yeah i've had i've had it actually like just four yeah, years ago it was um Okay, now I'm, no, I'm not gonna wait. I can't do this on my own sh no, own show. I don't want people to hear me go into tears on my own podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, my, it was my, it was when my, it was my when my father had passed away. Like it was, mm. uh, oh man, it was. Uh, like it, at first, it was just like that. I. Yeah, it was obviously a trauma on you know, like just yeah. sad. Then, um, then um, I was just talk, just talking to the monologists about things that, that are going mm -hmm. on. Then I sobbed like a baby. Yeah. 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 Then, yeah. It was just ugh. yeah no it's it's hard and it, and it's it's i think any any loss is really oh. is really not only difficult for the person experiencing it but oftentimes the people that are around that knows yeah. that like you're navigating grief mm -hmm. like oftentimes they don't really know how to support you and then sometimes you don't even know how to support you <laughs> when you're navigating yeah. that you know because yeah. all of these are like new emotions and it doesn't matter how long you've experienced mm -hmm. the loss the grief it oftentimes is ongoing because even when as i'm talking about the grieving process of navigating chronic illness i you know i'm like 12 years into my lupus diagnosis and i can say that like there are times where that grief happens and it happens in different ways depending on like the stage of life that you're in or like you know you have a goal and then and then you get frustrated by the fact that like you you can't reach it soon enough because of where you where you're at health wise you know but the way that uh, that we can live uh, live our truth in it is just how do we over, over how do you think that You've lived through you know, your truth mm -hmm. through it. Like how how did you define yourself through that obstacle? Right. Mm. right. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, there are a few things that I over the years that I managed to do to kind of help me through. Um, I think one was just like you know radical honesty mm. um i you know because you have to come with the terms that of your reality you know you you because that because you know part of the grieving process is denial and when you've accepted that like this is where you're at i think that's huge and it's a, it's really fundamental to how you end up handling like a health setback you know because you have to fully be able to look at it in the face mm -hmm. and recognize that like you know i used to do this and now i can't and this is how my body works now and and that's a hard reality to sit with but it also and becomes like the beginning of of a way through because mm -hmm. that's the other part is that it's not I had to come to terms that like this isn't something I can escape this is something that I have to navigate through and and also 
throughout my journey, I also had to learn that to lean on other people. And that was really hard uh, because I'm, you know, I'm an independent black woman, <laughs> you know, that tries not to depend on other people and all of that. But, you know, we, we can't live alone. We need community. We need people around us. And, you know, I think for me throughout the years of me navigating lupus and other subsequent chronic illnesses that kind of came from lupus in a way, um, I realized, especially during the times where I would, you know, I would get to a really dark place mentally because of all of the, you know, the, the mental health aspect of going through, you know, like heavy flares where you can't really function very much. I had to, to let others around me know that, you know, sometimes when I'm going through this, I withdraw. So I need them to message me. I need them to, to help me get out of that dark space because I won't be able to get myself out. You know, and it took a long time for me to even find the words to recognize that, like, yeah, I can't get out of this without someone. I need, you know, when I don't have any strength to, for example, do groceries or things like that, um, to not let my pride prevent me from getting support, (laughs) you know, because sickness will humble you quick, you know. Um, doesn't matter how, how strong and powerful you think you are when you are navigating a really hard health setback, you're all the way down (laughs) (laughs) and you have to, you have to lean on people and it's very difficult, especially maybe you're in a, you know, a season in your life where your trust is already limited and so you don't have a lot of people around you it's really really hard and so it it took a lot of having to lean on people even if I wasn't sure if they would even say yes because you know especially in moments where you've never asked people for that degree of help but then you realize that you need to because you don't you because that is how you can recover because you need you need pillars you need people to to be your strength when you don't have any you know mm. and so that was a huge way for me to kind of navigate through um my recovery because it it really does take a village you know i i have not har- arrived where i'm at alone at all it took It took not only my community, the people around me, but also um, a good care team, (laughs) if I'm, you know. (laughs) That's the thing for, just for our pride, it it can be so tough just to ask for help because we're, because for for some of us, it, it just can be so so hurtful just for our ego because we thinking okay we're I'm, I'm just gonna toughen this up i'm gonna toughen this out it's just i need to build up this resiliency and you know I'll, i can do this by myself i'll do this by myself and then it's oh no yeah that's the yeah. that's a major obstacle just even asking for help just saying yeah i need help yeah yeah and so and oftentimes you don't even know what kind of help you need but you know you do you know and that's hard and that's really hard because sometimes i remember especially early on when i had my diagnosis like yeah. you know there would be people that say you know let me know let me know what i can help with and I wouldn't know what to say. I know I, I would needed help, but I, I didn't I didn't really know what it looked like yet, you know. And so it, it was a lot of like just working through it alone a lot, actually, before figuring out that like, oh, I guess it could it would have been helpful if I could talk to someone, you know, or just like yeah, like just different things like that. Like it took it took a very long time for me to figure that out. In all of that, 
the time though that we've uh, that you've overcome uh, that like you've had all the um, the uh, faith your spirituality has kept you strong and i i just can't let this slide uh, by because you've actually been like just to show how uh, how much your talents and your your abilities go have been recognized like there's some stuff i found out about you <laughs> i mean come on performer at the edmonton poetry festival at the 2012 fest the canadian festival of spoken word you open for the 27th governor general the the right honorable michael jean the, so, Majin, when were you uh, going to tell me? <laughs> it's kind of wild, all those things, to be honest. Um, every every time I think about, like, just my own journey with poetry um, and the doors that it's opened and the opportunities it's um, it's given me access to, it's, it's always, like, mind-blowing <laughs> yeah. because because you know I, I I never really thought about writing for other people if that makes sense like writing has always been a way for me to process and what I'm and 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 for me to say out loud it kind of helped me um kind of solidified my journey and in mm -hmm. doing so I was realizing that like it was impacting other people yeah. and um, and it's been a wild ride so far, <laughs> yeah. and it was it was yeah definitely one of the major highlights for me was meeting uh, the right honorable uh, Michael Jean. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it was about a year or so after she finished her term as governor general, and uh, we had just a great conversation, especially given that she is also uh, Haitian. And um, and I wrote a poem about Nelson Mandela and and the lecture that she was about to speak on at the U of A was uh, it was around the impact of um, the Haitian Revolution and 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 its reflection around the legacy of Nelson Mandela and that was I, be I believe it was like a year a year after his passing was when she presented that and so. It was just really, really impactful, and um, and she had really great, um, just great words of encouragement for me yeah. to continue writing. And so, yeah, and that's the yeah, and that's the res represent the resilience of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And and also, I'm gonna ask you a little see some secrets of like the the writing, like composing process as a poet laureate you know like when doing spoken a word like when when going into your when composing mm -hmm. like do you some do you sometimes look at what you write and you're thinking you know you know what would go really good here Okay, uh, alliteration. Ooh, no, a synecdoche. Mm -hmm. Ooh, no. How about this? A, a metaphor, or you know, mm -hmm. your use of uh, of literary techniques. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. You know, what's funny is that like a lot of people now that I'm doing because I'm doing a lot of poetry and all of that. People assume that like my major was English when <laughs> you know English is my third language. <laughs> I went to school for biological yeah. sciences. And so for me, um, but I always loved wordplay. And so for me, yeah. it it poetry was just playing with words. And mm -hmm. so I never necessarily had like, oh, I should add 
um, you know, a metaphor, a simile, I think a lot in images. And so for me, sometimes I have an image that I want to like write about, like a, if that makes sense. And so that's how I end up writing. I'm yeah. just writing from the best way that I can describe what I'm seeing. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, and that's, that's how I, I end up writing more so than like, but then, you know, in the editing process, maybe that's when I, I kind of think about like just those mechanics, but, but when it comes to like the starting process of, of writing, it's some, oftentimes it's either like an image that I have or thought, or sometimes it's just a line that I heard from some, from someone, someone saying a, a quote that kind of sits with me and I don't, or maybe it rubs me the wrong way or, or a good way, but it's kind of living rent free in my mind <laughs> those <Yeah. laughs> those tend to become poems eventually yeah. and so yeah that's kind of a little bit of my my um my technique I guess um one of the things that I do a lot beyond like poetry and everything is just journaling yeah. and um if there are people that are listening that are wanting to get into just writing and poetry, I strongly encourage journaling and journaling in a way that's, to me, it's not a dear diary. Today, <laughs> I did this, 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 like at all. For me, like journaling is literally just like whatever's on your, in your head that day is what you write. I'm not, I'm not thinking about it being like coherent sentences. Sometimes it's just letters to myself Sometimes it's reminders of like things that I want to remember, whether it be like just words that I, I feel like I need to 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 hear right now <laughs> or or words that I heard some someone say that I want to remember or I want to kind of sit with or I or process why it's something like something rubs me the wrong way. Like journaling has been my way of processing because a lot of people sometimes when they try to come up with like a decision they want they want to be able to talk it out I'm not like that I sometimes I don't know how I feel about a situation until I write until I journal and then I was like oh yeah this is how I feel <laughs> so I'm an internal processor <laughs> not a external <laughs> process. <laughs> the way that you uh, that the that language gets played with and expressed by, uh, by, uh, by poetry. It just always fascinates me it, with just how, how, how techniques are, are coming out, mm -hmm. how like, even uh, up to the way that sometimes gestures are used to go with the flow yeah it's, it's almost like it's a adding to the cadence that you know, just to give the, that special you know, that delivery or pace that to give mm -hmm. it even cadence like i was watching amanda gorman when she was uh, uh, giving her uh, her poem the hill mm -hmm. we climb in right. 2021 i was noticing that she was moving her hands in that certain way and she was also at the same time having this certain pace and cadence in her speech and it's mm -hmm. almost like her hands were adding up to that mm -hmm. yeah i i also talk with my hands so that's probably why i love spoken word poetry <laughs> and i'm able to to use um yeah it's amazing yeah i love using just body language to kind of amplify what the message is and I think that's like the one of the most beautiful things about spoken word poetry in particular is that because it's a different it's a different mood when you hear poetry be read or like like be heard versus um, just reading a poem and um, and both are beautiful but I I I I, I prefer <laughs> spoken word poetry for that reason that it it just there's a way of like bringing it all to life. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know, Hamidin, there are three critical questions that I must ask you. Okay. 
So first off, what does living your truth mean to you? Living your truth means being radically honest in how you feel and making space for that expression um, and giving yourself permission to sit in those feelings. I think that's like huge. How does living your truth and being authentic make you a better person? It gives others permission to do the same. I think in the world where we are still very much in group thinking and what other people think, especially when it comes to social media, I think when we when you look at someone and you could tell that they're not trying to follow anybody else but themselves, um, it inspires people to look within themselves and to identify what areas are they hiding from the world because of the fear of being looked at as different? And it kind of gives them the permission to draw that out. Um, it gives other people the courage to draw whatever that part is out and to stand in it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And finally, what advice would you give to someone looking to embrace who they are? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say not to worry about other people's reactions to who they are because the right people will recognize the value you bring. And so trust those who respond well to who you are, because those are your people. Um, and that's it. Listeners, you can follow um, Majin on Twitter at Majin Speaks, as well as uh, Instagram at Majin uh, Speaks. Any other links uh, that I can uh, think of? Yeah, I wanted to also let you know, yeah, that I am in the process of launching my own podcast and it's called the Flare Up Podcast. And it's about, um, it's about mm -hmm. essentially, it's a podcast on the multi-dimensional layers of navigating chronic illness. Um, and chronic disappointments due to health setbacks. And, and it's a space where I want to be able to talk about just demystifying what it means to recover and to rebuild wellness in our own terms. And so, you know, it, the podcast is a little bit of a mixture of who I am. So there's going to be conversations around faith. There's, there's also going to be conversations with different care providers and different people who have gone through their own journey of uh, chronic illness or health setbacks. And we're gonna talk about lessons. We're gonna talk about those nuances and, and there will also be artist spotlight because I wanna like just have those conversations with artists who have had those experiences and kind of go behind the curtain kind of so to speak when it comes to you know some of their artwork that that deals with um, healing and to actually tell the story behind behind these um, these different art pieces whether it be spoken word or or song or whatever and so yeah flare up podcast um, right now it's still in the building stages but by but later on it's going to be out and um Subscribe and follow us on, um, it's going to be on uh, on Instagram as well. So Flare Up Podcast. <laughs> you heard it right here on this episode. Make sure uh, to follow uh, her, uh, her on social uh, media, when it, wherever it's available. 
Najin, thank you so much for uh, being here. And to all you uh, listeners and viewers, thank you so uh, much. And remember to stay true. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure that you subscribe and like, and you'll keep up to date with the content on my channel.